During the most challenging times, they'll rise to the occasion. This is Grace Moore with OTR Capital out here in Lithia Springs today. Giving away lunches uh, to truckers. When the supply chain was threatened, they kept the shelves stocked. We're out here today representing Marquee Insurance Group and OTR Capital, giving away a couple hundred lunches to the truck drivers we so greatly care about. Ah, welcome to Mad Games Live. It was a little OTR clip right there. You guys know I love OTR. They're our factoring company. They're sponsoring the show. Uh, I saw Grace in the clip, and I probably should have made it a little bit longer, but you guys know how I get impatient with stuff. What, in essence, OTR had a uh, celebratory event for truck drivers where they gave out free lunches and whatnot. I thought that was pretty cool of them. Uh, you will see the OTR people in the link in, I'm sorry, in the uh, chat, say hi to them, uh, reach out to them, ask them any questions. And I have links in the chat if you want more information on OTR. We have a really great panel of guests, um, all come from different backgrounds, and they are true veterans of this industry. What I wanna talk about today is how to vet your customers. Often what I hear from people is that they, they're excited, to get a new customer and they'll take anything. Um, they want the revenue to grow and then they realize down the road after a couple problems or slow payments or cargo bullshit, they'll realize, hey, maybe I shouldn't have picked this customer or maybe I don't know as much about the freight as I thought I did or, oh, they told, they told me I was running, you know, toilet paper and really I'm running some really expensive crap that valued high. So there's a lot of things to think about. I want to bring you the veterans who are going to tell you guys, here's how they vet and screen their customers. And then maybe if we get into more discussions, um, I want to talk about the relationship between brokers and carriers, since I have them all on the show with us. And lastly, I'm going to pay attention to your comments and I'll pop them up if you guys have additional tips on the topic. So comment as much as you want. Jeff Dickinson is here in the house. He hasn't been around in a while. We've got Rhonda, Matt Fink. I saw OTR Capital in the comments. The free coach is here, Chris Jolly. He has a lot of tips he could add to the comments. So watch for his comments. And Troy Andrews and Steve Perez. Steve is my dispatch buddy from Texas. All right, let's get started. I'm going to introduce the guests. Welcome to Mad Games, my three favorite people in the whole world. Um, Adam, let's start with you. Everyone knows you, but we're going to introduce you just in case. People All don't. right. Happy Friday, everybody. I'm Adam Wingfield. Happy Friday. I'm with, I'm with Innovative Logistics Group. We're a consulting and carrier services firm located in the southern part of the United States, better known as Charlotte, North Carolina. I've been in the industry about 20 years, and I love uh, Madtropolis. It gives us the opportunity to really kind of talk about industry uh, issues and really kind of get them to the forefront people. So uh, glad to be here again on another happy Friday. Thank you, Adam. And you guys, I follow Adam on Instagram as well as LinkedIn. Adam, do you still do your show on Instagram? We do. We do do a private show on Instagram. So, you know, just follow us on Instagram. Um, we uh, obviously where everything is content based. So, yeah, I love it. That was the first time that I met you was I was watching your show and I'm like, this guy knows his shit. Like, this is lovely. Um, OK, so now we've got Todd, which who, many of you already know because he's been on Matt Gaines quite a bit, but I love him to pieces. Um, Todd, is that snow behind you? <laughs> there might be a little left in there, but we've had warm enough weather that most of it's gone for now. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome. Could you tell us a little bit about your background and where you're calling from? Yes. Good afternoon. I'm Todd Waldron. Um, I, I lead Q Carriers here in Shakopee, Minnesota. Um, we're an asset-based um, trucking and logistics company. We have both the carrier side and we have a, a logistics brokerage division. Grew up in, in third-party logistics um, and spent five and a half years at one of the biggest three PLs. Um, and then transition over, opened a branch for another asset based uh, 3PL and spent six years with them. Um, and, and so spent four years uh, down in Arkansas that, that gives away any of the hints that LinkedIn might tell you as well, but spent time with them. So about 13 years um, total in the, the um, industry and then been with two carriers here for a little over a year and a half now. Thanks. Nice. Welcome. Thanks for coming on again. I appreciate it. And then a new face, but not new to the industry by any means. I've known Michael for years. Michael, welcome. Where are you right now? I don't think you're in a snowy region. I'm not. I'm not in a snowy region. I'm sitting in Chattanooga, <laughs> Tennessee today. Um, I've been in the business, uh, I guess, almost 15 years. Um, 
really kind of broad spectrum management in almost all aspects of the business. I've been I've gone from being in brokerage and asset to being in technology, being back into brokerage, spending time in technology. Um, and now I run um, our freight division for a distribution business uh, in Savannah, Georgia called Port City Logistics. And we also just started another business called Growth Nexus, really focused around um, kind of coaching young leaders in the business and advising freight tech companies, things like that. So um, whether it's good or bad, I think there's not a lot I haven't seen in this business. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, I'm excited to be able to talk to you about this topic. Uh, when Michael and I first met, we talked about, you might not remember this, Michael, but um, you had a whole big team reporting into you and I came and visited you. And we talked about how not all freight is good freight. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's one of the reasons that I wanted to bring you in because I think that's hard to tell your team, especially when you have pressure of revenue. Yep. Um, and meeting goals and you just want to take, 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 take whatever you can get and you'll figure it out later. Yep. Um, so, uh, so I would like you to open it up and, and if you could give us your thoughts when someone says that, Hey, we've got to be make our revenue goals. We are just going to take in whatever we can get, especially in fourth quarter. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, and I'm probably like other people on this call that has had to be sitting between a sales team and an owner on that, where the owner just wants to grow or, um, and, and Todd, you may have an opinion on this. Sometimes um, I've worked for trucking companies that just thought brokers could literally take anything. And so why aren't you just growing? And so when, when we talk about like not all freight is good freight, it really has a lot to do with not just commodity or value, but like serviceability, like the structure of your company. Like everything has a cost to operate. So I worked in a brokerage where we moved a lot of expedited LTL line haul. Mm -hmm. The brokerage I Day has zero business moving that freight yet because we don't have the structure for it, right? It's not to say that we that we won't, but you have to structure your teams in a certain way that can service that business. Overdimensional freight, like low value, high margin freight, like the cost to move a load is the cost to move a load in your business. So like it has everything to do with, I mean, people, the easy thing is to talk about risk and credit, right? Just under like, oh, is it, yeah. is it copper? Is it high value or is the customer credit risk? But oftentimes, yeah. certain types of business can be operationally disruptive. And so if you have a sales team that doesn't understand, and this is true in the asset world, right? Like if you, if you don't know how to service a customer, it's going to cost you money in terms of the way that you operate that. And not just from a legal or, or like cargo risk perspective, but literally from just a bandwidth perspective. So I think it's really important to know your business, know what you're good at, know what you're not good at. Mm-hmm. Um, Adam, what do you usually tell? Because I know you do a lot of consulting for on the asset side. Um, what are you usually telling your folks when they're stumbling around with freight? <laughs> and what I mean by that is they're doing what Adam said, which is taking in freight that they don't quite know, especially in the asset side. Well, I, how, what do you tell them? How do they screen the customers? How do they know what they're good at? So there's, there's, you know, I think on the last call, we kind of talked about the limited uh, availability to having that screen process, right? So, you know, a brokers typically in 3PLs, they have access to carrier 411 and they're able to really kind of look at certain data to say, okay, this is not a good person to put a pallet of freight on this person's truck. But on, on the adverse side, from a carrier mm -hmm. perspective, you don't necessarily have those. So there's a couple of things that we tell our folks that you've got to really be good at. You got to, you know, do they pass the sniff test? So the first thing is credit. I know Michael just talked about it. First thing is credit. You know, that's like absolutely uh, so important. I can't tell you how many carriers that get started and they're so excited, just like kind of how you said, Cassandra, they get out and they just happy to move. They just happy to move freight no matter what, yeah. it, what it pays. I'm just happy to move the freight. And then they realize they send it to the factoring company and OTR says, oh, no, we can't we can't pay you on this one. You know, good luck on recovering that money. And, you know, you're talking about 40, 60, 90 and sometimes never seeing that 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 pain. Yep. So credit is important. But I think also, too, uh, and, and, and even from a credit perspective, even if they're going to COD our clients, we've seen it to where the COD is not even legit. They'll get out there and they'll deliver the load and they'll get a a, a check, a business check. They go to cash a check and all of a sudden the bank is closed and the, the, that bank account is closed. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of uh, things that you have to look at it from a financial perspective. That's number one. Number two is that reputation. Right. So when they're looking on the, the truckstop.coms and the uh, the DATs, 
Are they looking for certification? Is that broker got a diamond bond? You know what? You look at the bond level on it. That'll tell you a lot. You know, are you going into the FMCSA safe for portal and looking at that broker to see if they actually have an active broker authority and they're not pending a cancellation? So making sure that that broker does have that in, in place. And, and I honestly, just just having this, you know, those certifications like the TIA being a part of the Transportation and Mediary Association is big for me. And obviously, you'll get that with the larger brokers firms. But what we tell people in when you're dealing business with the smaller brokers, you got to be super careful. You got to look at, you know, the first thing is to me, the, 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 the eyeball test really is if it's got a credit rating below an A, then obviously you want to do your homework about it. But uh, that's a trickle down effect. And we just we really, really, really. Uh, want our carriers to be educated and just seeing just a few couple points that lead into a further conversation. Because, you know, as a carrier, you know, I can't get down to Arkansas or Chattanooga, Tennessee to see what your facility looks like and see what your operations look like and get that, you know, that warm, fuzzy feeling on the inside that I'm okay with doing business with you. We've got to have some other variables that we use to kind of gauge that. And those are some of the preliminary things that we use to gauge. For sure. Um, Todd, when you when you are working with your teams um, and they're pushing you and just saying, Todd, we'll figure it out. What do you, what's usually your go-to? Cause I'm sure there's some people on here that are going to say in the comments, like we'll figure it out. We don't, it'll be fine. Like we're smart. Yeah. It's, and then we'll get more and more shipments and we'll become efficient. Yeah. Well, I think there's a segment of, of it where we can figure it out. And so that's where I like back up to some of the things that were said is first, are they a good company? The credit, do they have a legit website? What are the locations like? Are we going to extend them credit or all of that risk mitigation? Is the freight right for us, right? Is it hazmat and we've never done hazmat? Or is it flatbed and we're refrigerated? Or is it our core competency, right? And you can navigate some of that. Um, but a lot of in transportation, you can't figure out a lot of those operational characteristics until you get in. I do like to lead with a, hey, I just want to have a conversation. I don't like to lead with, give me a load, give me a load, give me a load, the old school approach, give me a chance. It's let me understand your network and through a series of questions, understand as much as you can. Um, but still a lot of those operational characteristics that lean on efficiency or that lean on if we're a good value fit for each other, understanding their procurement strategy and if they actually do what they say, a lot of that, it, it comes with time. And so I like to start high and try to understand their supply chain and see if there's a value between our companies um, that, that we can match what they're doing. But a lot of times they'll put you in the rate penalty box, right? And they'll say, well, just, just give me a rate. And so I'm not the type to say, well, let's just not do business with them. Well, let's play by their way that they like to play and then start to understand. We want an end game and we work towards that. And so we got to be cognizant of how much time we're spending on that. If we're doing spot quotes and it, if we never are winning anything and stuff, then we might slowly work away and just tell the customer we don't, we haven't seen anything fit. So I think some of that fit has to come over time. And there's a value as a broker in you can figure some of that stuff out, but you need to be transparent in that. And then the customer needs to understand if it's a relationship and they buy from buying from you, we'll let them know that we're figuring this out together. So you're not, you're not trying to make it up or not be transparent. It's amazing how many people out there take freight that they have no idea what they're doing. Cause I see, see a couple comments here. And, um, <clears throat> and I know like for most of the people who are watching this, they, they are pretty experienced. Um, <clears throat> afterward, there will be a lot of people who are watching it that are not. And it, it taking, I've seen example, I follow lots, I'm in lots of different Facebook groups and LinkedIn groups and a couple other things. And so I'll see people post shipments like, hey, guys, I just got a shipment. No, I'm not, no shit. I saw this. <clears throat> I just got a shipment from Home Depot. And they want me to cross border into Canada. What do I do? And I'm like, who the fuck is this? They don't even know how to cross into Canada. So, I mean, there's a lot of that out there as well. So I want people to understand the, the extreme spectrum of this yeah. <laughs> when I have the veterans on. <laughs> um, they, there's, certain, mm -hmm. there's certain areas like that, that are like, okay, we, this isn't a good uh, learning ground, right? Cross border mm -hmm. or hazmat or higher risk areas. It's like, yeah, it's not the time to learn that. But there are other things in new areas, new geographic regions from a logistics perspective where you can or warehousing or cross site. I mean, you can, you can learn some of that as you go. So you, you got to segment what's, What's something you want to risk 
cutting your teeth on or learning. But makes sense. I saw something from um, uh, Matthew Fink from earlier today when I made a post. I talked about some of the things you guys talked about. How not every customer is a good one. Not every customer fits your business. Uh, and Matthew Fink had said, he's one of my favorite people, said this is true, but many folks sell in this space are spray and pay and don't methodically determine fit until after problems occur. Um, so I wanted to point that out. That's more the direction that I was going toward. Um, what other thoughts do you guys have on this topic? What other tips and tricks do you have? Um, or should we move on? No, I think going back to like risk and credit management, that something that I think a, probably a big part of the audience, especially like Adam, like your customers, I'd be interested in your opinion. They don't have a credit department. Mm -hmm. They don't have a credit manager, right? Like, so you've got to know how to read a credit report. And something that's really important, um, if you're using Dun & Bradstreet, you're using Corterra, look at the total number of companies reporting, right? And look at, <clears throat> don't just look at their average pay, look at how they pay their carriers specifically. There are a lot of companies a lot of shippers in the mid-market space that maximize their working capital by having a big carrier base that they pay every 90 days. You see it a lot in commodities trading. You see it a lot in the metals and recycling space that they will they will they will have a big carrier base because they're going to pay you every 90 days. Yeah. And so they'll have a lot of carriers that they just keep they just keep moving the invoices around on. So I, I think that like how they pay their carriers is specifically important as opposed to how they pay some of their other creditors, right? Um, yeah. You know, the other thing I would say too is, um, uh, <clears throat> you know, technology requirements are different for different customers. Like, can you do EDI billing? Can you bill them correctly? There's a lot of, uh, you know, when you get into certain types of customers, they're going to want you to supplemental bill certain things, right? If you're a small business or you're trying to get going, you're going to eat up your working capital with billing problems if you don't know how to bill those customers correctly. Mm -hmm. And so there's, there's different types of customers that do different types of things that are the same. Like if you're dealing with box plant manufacturers, they're all selling to the same people. They all have similar problems and all of their employees worked at one of their competitors at one point in time. So if you can figure that out, you're going to have a very similar, same thing with can manufacturers or packaging manufacturers. If you get into something, where your shippers are all selling to the same people, you're going to experience very similar things operationally that'll mitigate some of those back of house problems. So even if you even if you manage the credit on the front end, you can still lose a ton of time and cash flow in in billing issues on the back end if you if you don't if you don't know how to service that customer. Um, and I'm sure that Adam, I'm sure you've seen it with small carriers. And then Todd, I know you probably dealt with big customers where it's the same on both spectrums. And, you know, I think Michael made a great point on that. And the one thing that, and, and I'll add to that, payment terms are so important, especially on my side. I know, Todd, on your side, it's a little different with the larger carriers, but payment terms for a smaller carrier, I, I, most carriers that get started in this business can't wait 90 days to get paid on mm -hmm. a shipment. And, and, and the thing about it is, it may be that just one shipment. It may be that one shipment that they took that's going to pay the insurance payment this month. You know what I'm saying? So um, that's that's one of the key things. So there's a couple of points that I have our carriers make sure that they review as well. You know, number one, what does the onboarding process look like? Just like kind of how Michael talked about, right? You got some things that you look for. Do they are they registered with carrier, you know, carrierpackets.com or my carrier packets? So it makes it very, very easy for them to get set up. Or they have fax paperwork that's like crooked when it comes across in an email. That's kind of a red flag to me. Um, but then also, man, I, I, if you've got a broker that just wants to email and doesn't want to get on the phone, you know, it's, hey, email for, for information. That's usually a red flag as well. And uh, realistically, if you've got a, a broker that, you know, that uses a, just a Gmail or a Yahoo.com address without having a, this, just a little bit of extra effort to get a domain and pay $10 extra a month and get a professional, you know, domain address, those things kind of set up as a red flag. And I'm not saying, I'm not going to sit here and say that, you know, that we won't do business with, with brokers like that. But these are just these things that these are risks that you want to lower the risk. And these are kind of red flags that you've got to do a little bit better on due diligence to make sure that you're selecting the right person to haul the freight for. Because just 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 one load, you know, I mean, and then and another thing, too, is that if it just seems too good to be true. OK, we've got a broker that's going to pay you thirty seven hundred dollars mm -hmm. for 250 miles. Pick up one pick, one drop. No, no touch freight. 
And you got to you got to you got to think about that a little bit. Um, that's 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 an opportunity for you to uh, to, to to get misrepresented mis mis uh, in the marketplace. But um, that's just a couple of extra points that I would do on my side, just from a smaller carrier perspective. And I think from everybody's perspective, like I do a ton of research. Um, this is going to piss everybody off. But when I worked in house and even now, if I have a client send me a contract with a shipper um, and Michael, I can't wait to hear your thoughts on this. So, <laughs> so I get the contract and I will research the shipper myself. And it's an old habit from back in the day when I worked for other brokers that were small and I knew they were fucking moving really fast and they weren't vetting their shippers. So I did it before we signed that contract. So I would search to see the shippers. I was crazy. The corporate commission status. I would pull a DMV report myself. I'd check with the credit that we extended to make sure it was right. But here's the other thing I did. I would go on and research their website to see what the retail value of their goods are. Because if we're accepting cargo liability and all this other stuff, I most most of the time I would say that the shipper's value was high when I got a contract sent to me. I so so Michael, I would ask the salespeople, I would turn around and ask the salespeople to send me the contract. They'd be like, Hey, um, did you ask them? Could you ask, do you know what commodity we're moving? Do you know what lanes or any part of the country? Um, and also do you know uh, the value, like a full truckload value, or if it's LTL, happen to know what they're looking for for value per pound. Um, it is very, very rare I've ever had a salesperson come back and tell me the answer to any of those. Yep. Is is that too much work to do up front? Should they be doing that kind of work before they even pick up the phone and call a shipper? Or how does that work in the real world? Because because there's Cassandra's world, and then there's <clears throat> we got to make money. Here's the real world. So I think it depends on whose world you're living in. Um, there's a lot of brokerages out there that get to 20, 30, even a hundred million dollars working fast and loose. Mm -hmm. We worked through some of this together, right? Like I took over a brokerage mm -hmm. and like, I found a desk drawer full of contracts that were being signed by salespeople that had zero markup in them for things like electronics and all kinds yeah. of shit that <laughs> we shouldn't have been like, you know, just like, like with indemnity provisions that were so egregious, just anyway. The a contract is going to tell you your operational responsibility with that customer. Even if a customer says, "Man, we've never issued a chargeback," if that that contract is going to tell you, if you do these two things, I can hold your freight charges or I can do certain things. So there there are legal things that a salesperson will never be able to understand, or it shouldn't take the time to understand. Let me say that not will be able to, but shouldn't take the time. It's not their job. But from an operations perspective, like that contract is going to tell you what you're responsible for delivering. And it's gonna tell you what's important to that customer. And more often than not, it's gonna tell you what is important to their customer's customer. Yep. So if you are a so good true. salesperson, not trying to get a load, but if you are a good salesperson, you'll want to at least understand the broad strokes of that contract, but what is this customer asking you to do, right? And then they'll say something like, well, everybody signs this. I mean, everybody, right? They I mean, the favorite say thing, it. and Todd, this is what I love, right? <laughs> well, JB Hunt signed this contract. Everybody knows it. <laughs> yeah. okay. Whatever. Um, the other thing yeah. I'll say, and I would, I know, I know Ron's not on, but I'm sure he's got some hot sports opinions on this. Some somebody made a comment, like, I can't believe people don't do research. <clears throat> I think what people need to understand is it's not always this a terrible salesperson that's not doing research. There are shippers mm -hmm. that specialize in this. There are shippers that specialize in playing the game of just make, just doing the carrier rotation. So true. One of the things that I tell salespeople is if you make a phone call and they offer to put you on a list, like for, for businesses that I run, like that's not our customer. You make one phone call, yeah, I'll send you a, like you don't know anything about, like you don't, you don't know anything about me as a carrier. You don't know how I vet my carriers. And so it's, it's incumbent upon the shipper too. Like if mm -hmm. all you care about is a rate, you don't know my bond, you don't know what my insurance policies are like, primary, secondary, if my, contingent cargo is worth like, you don't know anything about that. And you're going to send me a rate and put, let me broker your freight. That's a good point. Jackass. After we've talked one time, like you don't want that customer. Yeah. And I want to, like, I want to hit You can have it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to hit on your question and also the spray and pray question. And then Ron and, and um, Ron's question about how much research is done. And, and I, I, at a certain point though, 
I think other industries are spray and pray too. It's a numbers game to a certain extent. I get hammered with a ton of stuff that clearly have no idea who I am. Um, and so it's like how much you got to research the company, have an idea who they are, but the contractual, all of that stuff underneath, I'm like, to me, that happens after initial contact later on down the funnel. You got to do it before you move freight and you want to do it before you start moving loads for them. But you're going to spend a lot of time and all you're going to hear is these constant no's. And we're dealing with an educated buyer in transportation that knows what we're selling mm -hmm. and they're buying the same things. So are they buying or looking for new transportation or not? Typically is dependent less on the value you provide. So I like to segment my customers into the strategic sell, the bigger, I'm trying to understand them and what is the value that I'm going to provide to them. And then the ones that might be more transactional in nature, or I'm going to just see if they're interested in a conversation now um, before I do a whole ton of research um, and, and waste that effort. And so I, I do think there's a lot of spray and pray, but I, I, I do also think that is the result, like Michael was saying, of the industry's buying patterns in the past um, in, in the way that they, they buy transportation. So it, it's a tough, it's a catch-22 in some areas. I wanted just to just from uh, to kind of go back and to kind of to circle it all down into a smaller carrier perspective, you know, it's great, you know, just like Cassandra said that, you know, we could go through you or, or on that side and you can do a much more due diligence than you can when you're a small carrier, you're on a load board and you've got to make a split decision on whether or not uh, I can do business with this customer or not. And you have very, very, very limited KPIs that'll tell you that that's a good decision or a bad decision. It's very, very tough. And that's one of the things from a, a transparent perspective. I think that that's one thing that 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 we lack is, yeah. you know, the ability to kind of see that quickly in real time, because, you know, from a from a customer to a 3PL, there's kind of like that that woo in phase that, you know, let me take you out to dinner type phase. But when it comes down to that last piece of the supply chain, when it comes from that that shipper or that 3PL has already provided that pickup time, it's got a pickup number and PO numbers and they just need to move the shipment. There's not a lot of stuff that you can do in order to be able to vet that person out. And that's very, very tough. Uh, and it puts a lot of small carriers in a bad spot because I've seen at times where credit's fine. You know, you book the load, mm -hmm. credit's fine. You go submit factoring. Two months later, you get a get a charge back mm -hmm. in your factory company because all of a sudden now, you know what? They're no longer in business or their credit wasn't as good as it was. So that's tough. It's just tough. It's just tough. When I think you, and I think you need to be key to come back to square zero. So you, uh, uh, the speed might cause you to make a risk in that moment. The the issue is that then everybody's like, oh, this is an approved customer. We're going to haul more loads from and never nobody thinks yeah. twice because they made it through that initial filter. So it's well, like we need a, a system that says, oh, they bypassed the main filter. Let's go back to that filter and do some more due diligence after that, after the fact. Mm -hmm. Adam, are you seeing, when you're talking to small carriers, are you advising them to stick with brokers that have a Triumph Pay logo on a load board or a Truck Stop Load Pay logo? I mean, to me, like one of the things I think about, like, I don't want to carry, I worked at carriers and I know, um, I mean, Todd can wait on this. My old boss used to say, you know, we pick up pennies, right? Like that's, that sometimes in the carrier world, you're just you're you're really just managing that. <clears throat> I wouldn't want a carrier to have to worry about getting paid. I don't want my staff cutting comp checks, right? Like I I want carriers to not have to worry about payment. And I think with the amount of people that are willing to do third party underwriting on brokers, like I don't know why as a business we haven't just taken that out of the equation. Like if you're a worthwhile broker, you can get underwritten by even a small person can get underwritten by trying to pay or a load pay that logos out there that, but you have those, that's kind of your clientele. I'd be interested in your opinion on it. Yeah. And you know, honestly, it, it's, 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 it's funny you say that because a lot of times in the very beginning, when you first get set up as a new authority, you don't have access to, to nothing outside of the typical larger brokerage firms that do have that ability to take on that, 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 that associated risk and that will work with you. So you're a little bit limited, but we do, we do want our, our clients and we do want our carriers to be looking for those brokers that are either TIA certified, they've got some sort of outside certification, at least, at least a bond level that's outside of a, a silver or going up even into that platinum bond, and we know that broker's got the reserves to be able to do it and to be able to handle it. But, but, but unfortunately, in a marketplace like right now, with capacity as tight as it, as it is, there's brokers throwing up freight everywhere, 
And it's like, hey, who's going to get the highest playing fleet? That's who I'm going to go with. I'm just going to roll the dice and I'm going to take my chances. Wow. And it's it's scary because I would really, 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 I was looking at a, a reserve report uh, a couple of weeks ago. I was just looking at something. And I saw the amount of income and receivables on this particular AR. But then I saw the collection side of it. It was like almost four times the amount of money in collections versus what they had in receivables. I'm like, what in the world is going on? Yeah. But when this time, and, and I'm sure somebody with factoring can really kind of just speak to that, but I have never seen it like that before, to where it's almost completely upside down. Collections are just at an all-time high. Um, just with that particular situation, I just glanced and I'm not just thought about it. You know, you put two and two together, your capacity is tight, brokers is probably snatching freight from everywhere, and now carriers are just going to take the risk. Hey, you know what? I'll just give it a shot. I'll just haul it. But to your point, Michael, we really, really want to stay in a small bucket because you want to build up a reputation. You want to build up a reputation to where you can out branch. And the worst thing that can happen is when you first get started, you're, you, you've got tight, you, you're running a tight ship as it is. The worst thing that can get started is you miss a couple of loads that don't factor. And I have seen that put people out of business very, very quickly. So um, to your point, I'd prefer that we stay within a, a small window of brokers that you can build a great relationship with. You know, it's nothing wrong with, with getting a larger 3PL. You know, maybe Todd's got a great 3, 3PL. I'm just getting started. There's nothing wrong with me working with Todd and he's being my sole guy or just having a couple of brokers that I deal with just so I can get my reserves up, just so I can understand and learn the business a little bit more and not get caught in this 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 wave of just uh, just just anomaly. So I, I just think that for a smaller carrier, you know, for our smaller carriers, the risk is not worth the reward. I hear you talk about brokers a lot, Adam. Um, is that because most of the ca smaller carriers are working with brokers? Yeah. yeah. And and because um, they because they bitch about brokers a lot, um, and we've talked about this a lot. And I'm like, they a lot, and and but they are the customer at the same time. It sounds like. And when we talk about this topic, you're talking more about brokers. Mm -hmm. These two down here are talking more about shippers. I, I think that's interesting. Yeah, because I mean, when when you first get started, you're not gonna, you don't, you have no clue on how to land a customer, and not just that, who the hell am I, right? I'm gonna go knock on Todd's door and say, hey, I want to move freight for you. All right, well, what's your reputation look like? Oh yeah, my authority should go live in about two weeks, and I'll, I'll be ready to move freight for you. The thing about it is, he's got to trust. He has got to trust to be able to put two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars worth of freight on my trailer and expect that with no history behind it at all. That's like when you get out of school, when you get your kids, you know, you buy your kids a car and the first car you buy them is a Maserati or something. You got to give them the opportunity to see if they can parallel park first. Mm -hmm. So the thing about it is, is that with the smaller carriers, they typically traditionally use brokers for the most part. And from the standpoint of ambition, honestly, you got good brokers, you got great brokers and you got bad brokers. You got good carriers and you got bad carriers. And a lot of the, the bitching, in my opinion, is because it's just hearsay, you know, and not really yeah. being truly educated on what's going on. Do they even really know what the lanes are? And I know we talked about it the last time we was on a call. Yeah. Don't bitch about a broker and his rates when you're not when you have no clue on what your business is, your operational costs. Are. If you don't know yeah. your operational fixed costs, if you don't know your operational fixed variable expenses, if you don't know what it costs to move your truck, don't worry about what what, what a broker is paying. That's not your business. Your business. Mm -hmm. your business and that's what you need to worry about. Yeah. <clears throat> Gotta love that. I th so I'll talk about brokers for a minute. Uh, I, I, you talk about bottom dwellers, Cassandra, and you and I have talked about this. People that are willing to sign anything or haul any load. Like one of the reasons that I still have some some coaching and consulting clients is because I I want brokers to be better. Like, I want people to get better. I want them to be good at vetting their customers, but I also want brokers to be really good at taking care of carriers and understanding small carriers. Like one of the one of the things that I do when I train is I I, I teach brokers about a basic trucking P and L, like because to be a good broker, not sometimes you often need to help carriers better understand their own network. If a guy's got ten trucks, he doesn't have a safety department. He's outsourcing that. If you can get him running something consistently, right, and you can help a carrier understand that we talked about this before the call that like a high rate per mile doesn't equal a better network or doesn't equal better mm -hmm. yield, like. Like you're now you're partnering with a carrier, right? If you're just trying to put freight on the internet and you're just trying to beat up on a driver, or you're talking about that carrier, that driver, you're being pejorative about something like, um, I think there's a, I think there's a major problem with brokers not understanding what it costs to run a trucking company, not understanding to should have to know that. The second thing I'll say is that 
I worked for a really big trucking company and we had tame drivers, right? Yep. Like that's, yep. that's running a trucking company. So yep. if you're a broker and you're just worried about the cheapest guy out there, like what kind of freight is good for Q? I actually don't know. I, you should tell me, but like, you know, that that's where I'm going to put my, Hey, if sales staff of 30 people, like I'm going to have people go call and find freight that's going to work really well for you and your network. Yep. And, and I think that's, that's where we segregate or separate the asset sell and, and it's more confined. So the more specific your value or niche is, the more specific your strategy and target is. So on the asset side, we run refrigerated food grade freight. We can narrow in on that and the regions our asset network is or the areas our asset network is. But the logistics, there's more flexibility there so we can spray a little bit wider and we can expand into other freight regions and try to grow into those. Um, and so it's like understanding what you're trying, where your value is, identifying who you are who you want to to work with and what you what you sell and then what's your value you bring to them. You better be able to answer that before you pick up the phone and call Ron Kane at Monster or wherever to say, hey, let me be a carrier. You need to understand your size and scope and say, well, what is my value going to be to him? And I need to understand that. And 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 that should drive my strategy in in trying to engage that person or that contact. But I think that's the bigger issue is people not segmenting the customers and understanding who is in their level of contact or who they should be able to reach or, or provide value to. Um, but. Um, I, I'm getting uh, a couple pings that there is some slow feed. So just guys be patient with us. The feed will come back. I'm sure it happens, but guess whose fault? It's not, it's not my fault because I don't control the technology anymore. Um, I see Zeke is gone, so maybe that's why. Anyhow, uh, this will be available on YouTube for replay. That's actually the, the majority of the way people watch these things anyhow, <clears throat> not live. Uh, but I'll say that I, so, so what, especially from Adam, Adam, what are you telling people with regards to um, how much credit to extend, if well, at all? So, you know, I, that's a great question because I see times it, it just depends on it depends on the broker itself. I've seen times where if it comes up and we do a credit check and it asks for further review and then we put the further the, the review in and we ask for like, I don't know, maybe five thousand dollars and it says, well, you need to call. Then we know we might have an issue and it's probably somebody that you don't want to necessarily do business with. Mm -hmm. But you, 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 it just depends. It depends on how frequently you plan on using that particular broker, because obviously that broker is going to have freight and you're not going to be its only carrier. And that broker is going to be have to facilitate multiple movements. And if that one shipment is is going to cause that broker to say, hey, let's let's get a call and let's just make sure we can get this thing cleared. Um, that's probably something that you would want to go with. But from, from a carrier side, just from a smaller carrier perspective, uh, anytime it has to have a further review on credit, you probably want to look on that next load on the low board just to be on the safe side, just to be honest with you. Yeah, I have a lot of rules with credit um, because I worry, especially times now when capacity is tight and we may see more collections issues. Uh, I worry about shippers who can pay. And then I also worry about what Michael was talking about, but the shippers who shop uh, a lot and they'll pick up a new broker, they get their credit and they immediately give a bunch of shipments to that broker. Then they go to another one, do the same thing. And so they use up the credit really fast. They get payment from their customer and then they bounce on the bill. And during times like this, this is when it happens uh, a lot. And mm -hmm. it's a lose-lose it's a for carriers and brokers, of course. Um, Let me ask this from a size of company standpoint, might play into it, but is it good to have two different people doing those, one that's doing the sales side and one that's doing more of the vetting because it, 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 does it go against the nature of some typical salespeople? Like you look at the um, the stereotypical salesperson, they might not find energy from doing that, A. And also, do you want them focusing on the sale and then have a good team to support them if yeah. possible? I'd open that up to the other guys to see what you think. I, you know, obviously, size of company gives some limitations there. Um, but in, in an ideal state, when you when you have the size, I'd love to hear those thoughts. Yeah, I think there's, I think there's, those are good points. I think there's two things, right? Salespeople always want to be hungry and uh, I don't want them to have to deal with a bunch of noise. 
yeah. that keeps them from being sell. Like I don't want to turn salespeople into credit managers, right? Yeah. But I, I, I would always get really excited when my sellers would come and ask me the two or three questions that I knew were important. Hey, can you read this and tell me about this, 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 and this? And so, um, and and I'll plug I'll plug uh, Jolly on this. Like, if if you're having issues with vetting customers on the front end, not and I'm not talking about risk management. I'm talking about just good sales. Like, you should call Chris. He knows a lot about this. Um, asking just good qualifying questions on the front end, right? Um, and then that's where you've got to have really good sales leaders. So you should have like a like maybe no more than 10 to one, four to five to one is better, where you've got a good sales leader that's looking at the stuff coming in the door and just knowing like, um, and Cassandra, we did this together. We just had like a one sheet bullet point. Like what are the four things to look for? Yeah, like, I think, and that's, it doesn't have to be complicated. And I think that's just good selling discipline. Like, am I asking these questions? And then the other thing was, would be with compensation, right? Like have a good, have a good chargeback mechanism and think about your point of credit when you're going to pay somebody. Yep. Right, I like so I, I, I'm a fan of paying on invoice date, right? So that if there's paperwork issues and then, and then I've got clawback provisions for bad mm -hmm. debt. Mm -hmm. Like, and yep. so like, I think there's ways Todd to answer your question to put just enough skin in the game yep. where the salesperson isn't distracted. And I think you have to train your sales leaders really well to know what questions to ask to help their salespeople. Yeah. And at a minimum, the salespeople need to know and understand what that team is looking for and why. And, and so they at least have an understanding of it. Um, and so they can look out for that too. That's good. Oh, I see a question from Ron Kane. Um, obviously people know that he's the, uh, the wizard behind the screen often with this show. Um, he says, what's the panel thoughts? on tiered pricing, meaning I'm a good shipper, I pay quick and manage um, something well. Other providers have rebate programs. Do you guys have any thoughts on that? Todd, what's your thought on the rebate? <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask, I wanna know from the asset guy first. I, well, it, it, I, in theory, yes, right? Like. Like there should be, and, and that's more, you know, how dedicated price with some rebates and some gain shares and some more flexibility in the pricing. And I agree. Like if, if especially volume is the main thing that if routing guide volume and the actual volume um, that comes through in the business matches the routing guide to me that there should be, um, you know, some agreements worked out. So I love one, the idea of having a deeper partnership and visibility to what's happening on the shipper side, but then the cost on the cost or on the carrier side to what it costs to execute that business. And then we work out what happens if the business shifts, then we can adjust the pricing accordingly. And we're all in this together. And so it's great in theory, it's this, the nature of the industry's pricing structure that, that is this circular conversation um, where, where everybody forces us back to the price and the RFP process. And, and, you know, I listened to you last time, Ron, talk about the things you did with the co-op style, which is, is, is similar in nature. In essence, it's more of a partnership conversation in the pricing rather than a, a methodical um, bidding against each other and whatever the rate says you award based off of that. So yeah. I like theory. I think the difficulty is executing it. You also have a data um, integrity aspect in transportation that we're fixing as we try to implement technology in the industry. But th there's some challenges to that as well. I think what I've seen with a lot of rebate programs, I, I completely agree with what Todd's saying, is that they theoretically are good um, and they're very difficult to execute for both mm -hmm. the shipper mm -hmm. and the um, and particularly motor carriers are going to struggle with it more than a broker because brokers have bigger technology and bigger back offices. We can absorb it more. Like if I were to, if I were to look at a, at a broker's PL versus a strict asset PL, like it's, you know, tons of money goes into maintenance and recruiting and retention on, and, and brokers can just have more back office. And so then oftentimes rebate programs are third party managed. So now you've got some yeah. third party bank something right and then you've got a bunch of motor carriers and then you've got and so i get them in practice but what i can say as a broker is that um i, I had a customer one time their freight wasn't always the easiest to move because a lot of times it was production and i had to you know i had to dispatch trucks on the street and i had to have plywood and load locks and i operationalized that business really well and i bent over backwards for that customer they paid me in 17 days mm. 
EDI. Okay. Like my payment started processing when the bill got scanned. I mean, they were they were one of the largest customers, and we did every because, and and I had a billing contact. Like it was it was the easiest thing in the world to do business with them from an accounting standpoint. I've I've, I've had other customers where the bidding is very competitive. Uh, my back office has had to go into two different portals, deal with a payment company. So I, I don't know if, if I'm getting into Ron's question, but like if you are if I can bill you easily and accurately, and I don't have to deal with a bunch of rebills and collection issues, I'm going to take a margin cut because I can move your business. Because that probably means that you are a decent human being and I can actually sell your freight too. I, would like, say that I don't know, I don't know what your right. opinion is, Todd, but I've also know, I've often noticed that pain in the ass freight has pain in the ass billing. And so, oh. I'm I'm going to take a margin cut uh, if it's if it's easier for me to do business with you. Yep. With regards to um, obviously, I've been involved in a lot of unique and different types of freight transactions and contracting. Um, I have been involved in rebates with regards to sh profit sharing. Um, so if we save you this percentage on your lanes on your rates we will split it with you and we'll give you a rebate. Da, da, da. Um, it's, I haven't seen many successful churnouts. Like I'm super skeptical, skeptical in the beginning and I vet it as best I can, um, especially from a legal perspective, but I haven't really seen good turnouts with that unless it's LTL. And LTL obviously is more predictable and it's easier to do that on and you can negotiate the tariffs in advance. But with truckload, it's harder, especially this year, dear God. Um, but I thought the biggest point is, and I talked about this with Ron a little bit, was the trust with the shipper. Um, because we don't know, Ron, we don't know who's, who's you're reporting to. And you could leave at any point in time. We may trust you, Ron, but we don't know who else. And anything could change at any moment. Um, so there's a lot of trust that goes in. and. I, I'll say this is that often I don't, I don't trust the customers. I don't trust the carriers. I'm a lawyer. I don't trust anybody, but uh, it, that plays a bigger role in it than anything else. Like, um, and Ron said before, like he wants his partners to make money and not everybody views it like that, especially when they've got management above their head, breathing down their neck about saving money. Um, yep. it's, a, it's a good question. That's for sure. Yeah. And I think on Ron's point too, in the profitability volume conversation is, Yes, efficiency should drive a lower cost, and that's captured, I think, today in the RFP process. At least we account for that when we're putting a rate on the RFP. You take the market and adjust for the relationship, adjust for operating characteristics. And so I think you see some of that. Um, and, and I think, yeah, it, it would be great to be able to have more um, tied directly to activity-based costing so that based off of the activity and all of that, then the pricing should follow that. The one external factor though that's difficult is the fact in one-way transportation, you're then reliant on another customer or yeah. your backhaul freight. That's another thing that we can't control then and is often dependent on market. And so it's tricky with, we're, we're, we're you know, luckily there's technology that's coming that can help make more decisions like that and be able to say, Ron, I know how much your efficiency actually saves me as an organization. And we're trying to get there, but the majority of, of trucking companies just just aren't there and, and can't account for all those variables to be able to articulate exactly how much your efficiency saves us as an organization. And that's why I went to volume is to me, volume is also a big profitability driver. I keep saying we can't build a yeah. church Easter. That's what everybody wants in the industry is they all put their RFP volumes where they might think hit 60% of them throughout the year. And then they all bring 100% at the same time of the year. And so it's difficult to balance the trucks and the trailers, which is your most expensive cost and your biggest cost. Um, and so efficiency helps, but it doesn't always account for if there's if there's volume gaps in the in the routing guide. Adam, when it comes to pricing for your smaller carriers, um, I, is it it's safe to assume that you guys aren't doing a lot of rebates and and flat contracts? So on that note, though, how do you how do you recommend your carriers, because this does play into vetting a shipper, price the lane accurately when you don't know the shipper and you don't know what's going to happen along the road? Like someone told me like beer is super heavy. 
and and is more and is more weight. They fucking hate running it. Uh, tires and a couple other things like cow hides make your trailer really really stink. But you wouldn't have known that mm-hmm. unless you had to go through it. Um, so what are you telling folks? So there's a lot of things that go into it, and you know, like like you said, beer is super heavy. And when they load beer, they typically load beer on three quarter tank of fuel, and they put you at full. I mean, you're realistically at full eighty thousand pounds. And that's tricky, especially if you're taking that freight. It's different if I'm taking that beer freight across flatland as opposed mm-hmm. to pulling hills. So if I've got to pull mountains the entire time, I'm, I'm, I'm blowing diesel fuel out. I'm probably getting three miles a gallon the whole the whole trip. And that's going to eat into my cost, too. And one thing that you that I find and it's it's so interesting, the heavier the freight. And it almost goes to a point that Michael sta- stated earlier that, you know, all of a sudden there's a correlation there. But when you see beer freight and things like that, that typically doesn't pay market pricing. So the problem is, is that the accuracy of the information that's available to smaller carriers is very, very limited. So when it comes to be able predicate to predict the lane, there is no real time visibility like on a broker side i would state so you know for instance with freight waves they have this 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 sonar technology which at least gives you the actual tenders that were priced in that particular lane versus any other rate watch where the rate watch is based on the actual postings that's in the lane so there's a huge difference if there's if we're counting postings where as a broker or as a 3pl we've seen them post multiple multiple locations for one load I mean, it might be like four or five locations for one load. And what that does is skews the data on the actual pricing on a lot of the, the load boards. So the load board might say, hey, this particular rain, lane has been averaging over the last 30 days, 237 a mile. You call up on that freight and they're like, oh, oh, yeah, absolutely not. We can't pay that. That's not even, you know, not even close. So that's one problem. And I think the second problem is this overall transparency to be able to see what's actually in the lane and understand it. Because one of the things from a carrier perspective is when you don't know your break even point, you don't know what it costs to operate your truck. You have no clue on where you need to even start with a pricing. So, and one thing we'll see is that they don't really, for the most part, don't really understand the true supply and demand that plays into that. You know, as far as like, you know, you got your markets like, you know, your South Florida markets, your upper Northeast, like in Maine, those marketplaces where you don't have a lot of, of commerce coming out of those areas, but you got mm-hmm. a lot of trucks coming in there. So that cr- it creates an imbalance, right? So that, mm-hmm. that, that puts more trucks than shippers. Now, obviously, that's going to that's going to that's going to deter the rates. And so given that education up front and really showing the 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 importance of understanding the supply and demand, understanding how lanes work, understanding how volume is predicated, understanding when you're going to have the peaks and valleys there. That's really important, but it's unfortunate that that, again, once again, and this is for the small carriers out there, I love my small carriers, they just don't have that information available. It's not, it's not popular. The one thing that you hear all the time is that if you, and, and I'm sure there's brokers on this call, they're always talking $2 a mile. Oh yeah, I'm, mm-hmm. I need $2 a mile. I need $2 mm-hmm. a mile. I mean, I, I, my, my, my guys, even your dispatchers over here, hey, my, my carrier needs $2 a mile. No, he doesn't. You know, you, let, let's let's be practical. Let's be sensible. Let's make a make let's make a rate where me and Michael, we can both walk away happy, right? Mm-hmm. Where we can walk away happy. You know, I'm not pulling his leg. He's not pulling mine. We can take care of the customer. But in order for me to do that, I need to know how much it's going to cost me to move my truck anyway, right? So if I don't know how much it's going to cost to move my truck, I don't even know where to start with pricing. I can guess. I can say, oh yeah, okay, yeah, I need two dollars a mile to move this lane. But what if my what if my cost of operations is two oh six? What happens then? Now I'm just moving freight across the country for free. For free. So that's the that's the problem, um, honestly, Cassandra. Is that it's a gap in education. You know, yeah. it's a gap in education and it's a, certainly a gap in available resources. And when you talk about tech, tech is one of the biggest gaps that we see. And you 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 bring all of this stuff together. Right. You know, these we've got multiple systems and multiple people just not being able to communicate with one another on one system. It just makes it, it makes it, it just makes it just terrible. And that is why it is so important. The literacy, the financial literacy um in, in a trucking organization and a trucking business on both sides from a broker side and a carrier side is so important because we see so much 
um, where it's just, hey, you know what? I'm just going to throw a shot in the dart. I'm just going to guess well, how much you need on this load. Oh, yeah. Uh, hey, I'm going to need at least two dollars a mile on that load. And, and, and God, you're not even factoring. Hey, you know what? Yep. The fuel on that lane, the, the surcharge on that lane. You have no idea on what you know, what, what deadhead opportunities it's going to create. Is there going to be head mm-hmm. home coming out of there? How far mm-hmm. am I going to have to backhaul to get into a better rate? I'm, I'm going to I might have to take something short dollar mile freight to put me in a better marketplace. But but I don't think the consideration is there. Yeah, I mean, you're right. Like the easy button is not the way to go, right? Like looking at a load to truck ratio and a posted rate, like most people don't realize is that in power lanes, right? You take Atlanta to Harrisburg, Dallas to Denver, Dallas to Atlanta, like the, the market makers, the three PLs that have those, they don't report those rates. Mm-mm. Right. And the trucking companies that move that on a backhaul, they don't, because re- I've worked at them. Like, wow, that's a good it's point. Not, they're, they're not real rates. Like you can, I challenge any, any carrier to go look at a big hot market power lane and look at total number of reports and total number of companies reporting. Like it, the math doesn't work. Mm-hmm. So yes, if you're a small carrier, you cannot, is it, is it statistically correlated to the market? Absolutely. But is it accurate? No, it's not. It's way more important to understand your operating costs. The other thing I'll say, and I'll probably get trolled or flamed or whatever they call it for this, but you brought up- We all do. <laughs> you brought up beer and water, right? Yeah. So at some point we should have a show with Ron and some other people and talk about how uh, the big beer and water companies, who are their top carriers? They're not asset carriers. They're brokers. And they're brokers that don't make money. Mm-hmm. And so what you, saw, what you saw in 2019, and I, and I saw mm-hmm. this, like I sit at my mm-hmm. desk and see it. Those, those are, that's what Todd was talking about, how you can control a one-way even if you're running hub and spoke and you only have four or five power lines, you maybe can control your one way outbound. But when you rely on certain predictable things to happen in backhaul markets, and then your customer takes the freight from you, gives it to another broker that's drastically undercutting the market, and that broker turns around and gives it back to you mm-hmm. for 20% less, mm-hmm. because guess what? You haul 20 a day, and you have to haul them to get back to your core customer. Like that happened in every major market in the country in 2019 to all the big asset carriers. And so there's a there's a real issue, I think, with just stewardship in terms of how are we treating carriers and taking some of those backhaul markets and balances into consideration. That's hot sports opinion, whatever, but mm-hmm. I watched it happen. Mm-hmm. Ron says you can't pay a lot for transportation when your margin is less than 5%. That's a really good point. And we know the, at least with water bottles, you also have to, uh, this is everybody who's watched me has heard this before, but that's another part of screening a customer, know their cargo claims, because you may be excited about getting that new water bottle company, you get all these lanes and you're really excited about it. And then you realize why people are passing them up. Um, we have literally two minutes could, we can go a little bit over it with this question, but I really wanted to get your perspective, each of your perspectives on this. So we'll start with Todd. Todd, um, in your opinion, what does it mean to be a shipper of, of choice? Is that a bullshit term? Like, let's just be real about that. <laughs> and Adam's already laughing, but I hear Ron brought it up too. And I'm like, first of all, I'm curious from Ron, if shippers even care about being shipper of choice. Or if it's just some hoopah, like give give this fucking big company an award. They're our sh- shipper of choice, but really it's just some song and dance. And okay, I'll stop. Go ahead, Todd. Their, their care is relative to the market conditions. It, you know, in my opinion, like and so it was a big term, and then you didn't hear, yeah. it, and then it's even a big term again, shipper of choice, right? I think it is really important. Um, I, I, the, at least the theme behind the the, the label um, is that trying to um, allocate transportation costs to activity and the term shipper of choice is based on the activity or operational characteristics of that shipper. How well they do what they say they're going to do, their their dwell times, um, their you know, payment terms, and et cetera, et cetera. And so I, I think there there is a lot of value in being that. And I think shippers are starting to care more as over the last five to 10 years, transportation has become a, a higher um, level on their PL and become more and more as costs increase. 
they, they care more about that. Not only how do they move their freight differently, but are they doing it in the best way possible um, to lower their cost? The trick is, is tying a cost to that activity and then allocating the freight based off that activity because the, the, the market weight of the market procurement keeps coming on top of that, um, especially when the market goes down, right? And, and it drives down costs. Um, so much that it doesn't even matter. And so then when it goes back up, I would say carriers do allocate for that. They know who the good ones are, the loading times. I'd say if we compared RFP to RFP in the same markets with good characteristics versus bad, I think you would see a difference. And so I think there is and has been um, some accounting for that, um, it, but it's more um, you know with the wind kind of estimates based off of what we think it's going to cost and not saying that this each hour of detention gets you one cent per mile less or something like that. Yeah. So I think that it, it should encapsulate a lot of things. And, you know, it kind of takes me back. And the reason why I was laughing, because the first thought that came to my mind <clears throat> when you said shipper of choice was the video that you played in the very, very beginning. Like, so as a carrier, <laughs> I, you know, I'm, I'm not going to say I want to pull up to a shipper and people are jumping up and down and, and got pizza waiting on for me and got a sign and parade and all that good stuff. But I will say I want to feel like I, I, I want to feel important. I, and when I think yeah. about that, there's a lot of nonverbals and there's a lot of uh, things that can go along with that. I look at facilities, right? I yeah. Look at how accessible it is. You got some places where you go to, you open up the shipping office and, and they'll curse at you as soon as you uh, leave, leave the door open or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think about, you know, hey, just like Todd said, you know, what about detention? What does that look like? You know, what is that in terms of, hey, I'm going to get you in and out, get you out very quickly. I'm going to get you loaded. I'm going to get you unloaded quickly. Right. And I also just think about just, you know, even the smallest things. It's like, hey, you know, do you like if I'm I've got a carrier coming in, is there parking available? Is there any place where they can go and stage themselves and prepare themselves to enter the facility uh, and just to streamline that process as much as possible? But I just we did a show. Um, about a couple of months ago and it was just on during the drive appreciation week mm -hmm. and you know it's just like our conversation we had a candid conversation you know before the show went on and i just it, it, it the level of appreciation um should 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 resonate you know in terms of of, of when you pull up to a shipper that stuff should resonate you know what i mean and and there's a lot there's involved you know obviously there's a side on the shipper side to making sure that they're cost reducing and and those type of things but it's got to go all the way through the entire supply chain process all the way to the end uh, and honestly, I just think that just to be honest, I just think that the, the, the truck driver is the one that gets left out the door in that decision making process. Yep. Yeah, I, I was going to say, I think I'm all I'm all for shipper of choice. And if, if Todd and I get to vote on shipper of choice, our vote should uh, we should be the Electoral College that is just uh, that is just saying what our accounting departments and drivers feel like. So I'm for shipper of choice if the accounting department and the drivers get to vote on it. Because they're. Again, I have a lot of hot sports opinions about this, but there are shippers of choice that are horrible when it yeah. comes to processing bills yeah. and horrible when it comes to the way they treat drivers. Yeah, hey, so my not, big award. If somebody else, can, like, please don't leave me alone in this. Todd. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I don't understand that. They don't pay me very fast, or yeah. they. My drivers are all there ten hours, and the freight's forty six thousand pounds. I don't understand that, yeah. right? So, if we can let our accounting departments and our drivers vote. I say, let's make shipper of choice bigger than ever. You have, and, and that's the, the um, you have to quantify this, uh, the aspect Adam mentioned and voting or surveys and all of that is gonna help do that because detention, dwell, payment, you can quantify that, but the how they treat people and the, the essence of their facilities and all they have, you have to first capture it and then quantify it to then translate it into a price difference. And, and I think, we're getting there as an industry, but but we're certainly not there. Yeah, but, it's yeah. just like you know, it's like Todd said, man. It should start with the that first category, and then that's kind of like the 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 the, the prerequisite in the door. You know, that's how you get in the door. Is you know that's that's part of it, but you can't you can't consider shipment or shipper a choice if you don't. If the end result is, hey, you know, we treat people like crap. You know, it just just doesn't yeah. it doesn't work that way. Yeah. But it has like I saw the shipper. I'm not going to say any identifying names or anything like that, but there was this big thing that came out on social media like look at these we gave these shippers awards and they're like here are our top five shippers and 
this is the industry voted and da da da. And they were literally the worst shippers out there. Like people rolled their eyes when they saw that. Um, so I think that it's, it's this weird thing. Like why we even do it? Um, and, and I'm going to, I'm going to sure I'll get trolls for saying this hands down, but I'm going to push back on the driver community because I'm all about appreciating the drivers as the ones doing the jobs. I am, but we all play a role in this industry. And sometimes I feel like drivers forget that they're a business, they're owner operators. That means you're your own business. You can go work for a company and be an employee, and then you can demand that employer treat you a certain way. But when you're an owner operator, you decided to have your own company. So no one's out there watching your back, just you. So when you're on the shipper's properties, sometimes they come feeling like, oh, you know, why isn't this clean? Why aren't there bathrooms? Why are you kind of push me off your property? Da, da, da. I know people are gonna hate me for this. So I'm gonna be the one who says it. And it's often because you show up on the property and you trash a place or you don't have workers comp insurance um, or you're driving back into things. Like I see the problem ends, so I get it yeah. and I see it. But at the end of the day, like you're your own company. So you've got to plan and know the location you're about to show up and plan for that not to have the facilities that are appropriate for you. I'm going to be that dickhead on this thing. So so I, if, it was, if I had a magic wand, I would get the fuck rid of the shipper choice award completely. Honestly, I'd, I'd have everybody appreciation week because those small carriers that get a whole week of appreciation, we got brokers out there that are their salespeople. We've got shippers out there who are constantly raising their hands saying, do you guys even like hear us when we tell you what we need? Um, do you guys even forget that we're the ones paying the bills? So my rant, I'm sure that I'll get shit for it, but that's my rant for the day. <laughs> I'm not saying anybody else down here feels the same way. Um, so to wrap up, um, this was a really intense episode. I have a feeling that a lot of people are going to have to rewatch it because there's a bunch of things that you guys said that I didn't even know about. Um, Adam, some point in time, if you would tell us how to tell the difference between brokers bonds, you talked about gold and diamond and stuff like that. Uh, maybe you'll talk about it on Instagram and we can follow you. That'd be awesome. Um, but you guys all know these, are, I definitely brought you the veterans. You guys know who to reach out to now. Um, and thank you guys very much. I think we can, we can wrap up Zeke since I'm no longer in control of the tech. <laughs>